your Bibles in Matthew chapter 5, and uh, again, I just want to continue offering my thanks to all of you all that have uh, given me and our family some time to do some recharging and uh, resetting, and certainly uh, in our absence, I want to thank God for all of the folks, all of our pastoral team that have uh, held down the fort since uh, we've been away, and uh, Pastor Erna, of course, and Pastor Tanisha, and Minister Mike, and all of them, Minister Wayne, uh, people have been just so amazing. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a great gift to know that you have folk that you can count on. I, I was telling the earlier service, you know, uh, one of our greatest fears as, as a pastor is when you know you need to take some time away and you just worry that if you don't not there, people ain't going to come to church. And then the, the offering's going to be down. Then you can't make payroll. And then, and then you come back and two people are left. And then you're just like, oh, man, and you feel so guilty. And uh, so to come back and the house is still full and the saints are still showing up and y'all smiling, ain't nobody mad at each other, at least I can't tell. Thank you for your act. No, just playing. Um, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for um, just staying in your position, our greeters, our music ministry, our children's ministry, everybody. Let's just give everybody a great big hand, a round of applause. And uh, I want to just, to our 11 o'clock service, uh, just reiterate my deep joy and appreciation for our newest uh, uh, addition to our music ministry. Amen. Uh, Brother LJ Holloman, he is uh, someone that uh, I have uh, known uh, from afar more than uh, any, any real friendship per se. Uh, his, he comes from a, a, a very uh, just important gospel music family uh, here in the Bay Area, the Holloman family, his mother Lola Holloman and, and all of them singing folk they got. They helped to create uh, what we call the Bay Area sound of gospel music and uh, I remember uh, doing some ministry with LJ at Bible Way when I was the uh, assistant to my pastor and, and uh, worship leader down there and, and uh, you know he's been um, just uh, amazing gifted um, uh, artist and music uh, person for many years traveled all over the world with all kind of artists it, it, mostly anybody you can name he's he's been with them all over the world and, and uh, we was joking that the older you get after about your hundredth air, airplane uh, uh, flight, you're like, you know what? This is overrated. And you start figuring out, how, I, how can I stay home more? And of course, back then, I think we both was a little thinner back then. And so, you know, you fit in them chairs a little differently. <laughs> your back, your neck, my neck on my back, right? Everything just start hurting. You're like, you know what? I'm going to stay home. And, uh, and uh, I want to appreciate Minister Mike and all those who were able to help track him down. And and he's gonna be with us for this season. I just will hope y'all get a chance to meet him and know him. He is a wonderful, wonderful brother. Um, uh, again, he's one of the best musicians I know, I've heard in my life, and so I'm just honored that he's here and he'll bring good, some good old gospel funk, amen, to our, 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 our ministry in a super dope way. And uh, between uh, Lauren and, and LJ and, 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 and the rest of that band, we gonna be all right, amen. And uh, I'm thankful and excited about that. All right, Matthew chapter 5 is, is where we're spending the next few moments. And I, I don't plan to be before you long. I, I was telling uh, Pastor Ernie and him, I almost called in sick this morning. I wasn't feeling that well. And then, and then I said, you know what? I've been out for so long. Amen. I better just go to work today. Amen. <laughs> just go to work and, and I feel better since I've been here. Amen. Uh, so so uh, we're, we're going to go to the book of Matthew. Uh, the book of Matthew is a wonderful, wonderful text, uh, a record of the gospel. Remember that we have the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels. All four of them were written or attributed to different uh, writers who had an eyewitness account, at least of what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced. All of these writers... Uh, as they gave their account, they did it with a particular audience in mind. John was writing to 
uh, some think a, a more uh, 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 audience that were trying to respond to uh, some of the, the uh, synchronistic expressions of the gospel. People were, you know, starting to mix all kind of ideas about the gospel and, and uh, Gnosticism and all these kind of uh, thoughts. And John was trying to say, hey, let's, let's not get confused. Uh, there were folks back then who were saying Jesus was not a real human being. Jesus was a ghost. He was a figment of people's imagination. He just seemed to be real. John was like, wait a second now. I laid my head on Jesus' shoulder. Amen. So I know it. Amen. I, that, that was a real experience. Amen. I was one of Jesus' ace boom coons. We went to the mountaintop. We went to the grave. Jesus was for real, for real. So don't y'all be rewriting history up in here. Amen. Uh, then you had Luke who took the eyewitness accounts of, uh, of Paul and a few other folks. He was writing uh, some of this to Theophilus. So it was a Greek audience mostly. Then you have Mark, who had uh, the, earliest, the earliest written record of the gospel and was talking mostly to a, a, a Roman audience. And, and he uh, took the testimony of Peter and captured that. Then you have Matthew. Matthew, uh, as you may remember, was one of Jesus' followers. He was one of the 12. He was a tax collector, meaning that he was one of these folk who were swindling people out of their money. He was a Jewish guy who was a tax collector working for the empire. And so he was out here stealing Jewish people's money and giving it to the empire under the guise of collecting taxes. Matthew got, got uh, introduced to Jesus, and, and Jesus turned Matthew's world upside down. And Matthew then spent uh, not only his post-Jesus ministry or post-Jesus experience writing what he saw and heard, but he had in his mind the audience of the Jews, Jewish people in that time who were on the lookout for a Messiah, on the lookout for a Messiah who would liberate them from their worst conditions in the Roman Empire. And so Matthew, of all of the texts written, Matthew was attempting to help people appreciate that this Messiah has come and he fulfills all of the prophecies of the Old Testament, of the Jewish scriptures. Matthew attempting to write to a particular audience, just as Mark, just as Luke, and just as John. And I find this to be important, particularly as we're talking about Black History Month, because it is always the case that God meets you in your experience. And it is always the case that God wants you and I to be firmly planted in a time and a place. You will never follow Jesus long enough to be historically detached from time and place. There are some folk who just feel like, you know, hey, you know, uh, it's just me and Jesus, and we just got this super ahistorical, transcendent relationship that is grounded in eternity. Tell your neighbor, not yet. <laughs> while, while you're still breathing, God's going to meet you where you are. Some of you ought to get excited about that. Amen. God, God, God's not going to meet you where you're not. Uh, God's going to meet you where you are. If you're a Jew, God's going to meet you in your Jewishness. If you're a Roman, God's going to meet you in your Romanness. If you black, if you white, if you rich, if you poor, if you queer, if you're straight, if you a Republican or a Democrat, if you an American or a Russian, if you from Venezuela or you from the Congo, God's going to meet you where you are at. And when God meets you, you better hold on because God ain't coming to play patty cake with some of us. Amen. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody. How, how many of you witnessed me? God ain't played patty cake with me in a long time. Man. God's coming to help me get, get myself together. All right, so here we find then Matthew chapter 5, and, 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 and Matthew writing to the Jews, right, 
helping them to understand exactly how Jesus fits into their notions of the Messiah. In the book of Matthew, you find the longest uh, 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 teachings of Jesus. Most of the time, if you got one of them old school Bibles, uh, you find uh, Jesus' words in red. Anybody got one of them Bibles yet still? I, mean, I know a lot of our Bibles is on our technology, so there ain't no red on there no more. But how many of us can remember when, you know, you had the red letters in your Bible? Amen. And, and you realize, man, when these red letters pop up, I need to like, I need to stop daydreaming and pay attention. Because this, 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 some, this some non-negotiable stuff going on right here. And all this other stuff we got going on, you know, is good and all. But when the red letters of Jesus start popping out at you, you, you lean in a little bit. Make sure you don't miss this part. Well, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7 put together is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, meaning this is one of the longest teachings of Jesus captured at one time. And some writers and theologians say that if you want to master the, the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus, you ought to just memorize and follow the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You ought to read that this week in your free time. Because it is a lot in there that will make you feel like you are over your skis a little bit. You know, you spend, we spend a lot of time trying to, trying to memorize the whole Bible and trying to follow all these made up laws or these, these doctrines or these things that we've heard people say, you know. And, and then you realize, man, if I just try to follow the words of Jesus, I'd be doing a hundred. I'd be doing a thousand. I'd be keeping it real, right? Well, well I, I want you to appreciate that in this passage that we're going to read today, as we are still in the season of epiphany, where God is trying to reveal and show us some things, these are the words of Jesus to us, the followers of Jesus, describing to you and I who we must be and how we must be who we're called to be. Jesus says it like this, 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Notice it don't say God flavor, but it's plural, God flavors, which means that God got more flavors than yours. Uh, some of y'all just went over y'all head already. <laughs> Amen. You ain't the only flavor God is trying to, you know, attend to. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them there's more than you up in here. Amen. <laughs> Bring out the God flavors of the If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. Notice it said colors. I just want you to understand the, the plurality that these passages suggest. In a very binary world, God works in the shades. Ooh. I didn't say that this morning, but that felt good just now. <laughs> God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives by opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God. This generous father or heavenly parent that is in heaven. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're gonna speak from the top for a few moments. Don't forget who you are or better yet, remember who you are. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our hearts. 
so we will not sin against you. And let the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may it rest upon me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. If you don't mind, give your neighbor a quick high five and tell him, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Now, this, this is an important ex exercise. Memory. Remembering who you are. Remembering who we are called to be. Because quiet as it's kept, you and I are more often than not apt to forget why you are here. Not here at church on Sunday. I'm talking about here in the world. Some of us think we're here to get a boo. That's part of it. Because, you know, God wants us to be in relationships of mutuality, reciprocity, safe, loving, affirming relationships. Some of us think we're here to get some money, get some bread. As Marshawn said, take care of your chicken. <laughs> but that's not the only reason you're here, take care of your chicken and your mentals. You and I must remember, as the old saints used to say, only what you do for Christ will last. Since you can build great cathedrals, you can make all kind of money, you can have a name of renown, but there is one thing that will last, and it is what you do for God. How will you build a legacy that outlast your lifetime. This is indeed one of the great gifts of Black History Month, I believe, is that it allows you and I to take seriously that we all are a part of history or her story or a story. That it is not the case that we are all just out here disconnected from a story that began before you got here. And part of why we need black history and the ability to tell and pause and remember is because you and I can easily be hijacked into someone else's story. Amen. Someone else's project. Mm. Someone else's mission and think that this is the total summation of why you've been created. Mm. And you know, how many of you spend some time totally consumed by a certain project or mission only to realize after one year, two years, five years, ten years, you're like, you know what? This, this was not the best use of my time. No. <laughs> oh, they trying to mess with y'all too bad I've been here now. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> you, like, you know, I can't get these years back. Right. Amen. All you got from that experience was a lot of lessons, so it wasn't a total waste. But now you're looking back like, man, I wish I'd have got out of that a lot sooner. Amen. I don't know what I'm talking about, but you know what I'm talking about. From Amen. Well, Jesus then comes to help you and I always reorient ourselves to a higher calling, a higher telos, if you will, a higher purpose to help you and I remember that there is more to you than the description of success that our culture, our world, our society would try to define. And if we don't remind ourselves that there's more to your existence than your titles, than your money, than your honey, than your, 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 your goals that are really at times an exercise to fulfill our own ego, feeling and need to be seen, heard, and celebrated. Because some of the things that you will have to do won't, rec won't result in anyone seeing you the way you want to be seen. You're going to be in some relationships. It's going to be like, Lord, ain't no glory in this story. <laughs> I can tell you something. Amen. Amen. 
work relationships, parent relationships, you know, kid to parent relationships, partner to partner relationships. Some relationships, they, 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 they something else. And Jesus comes onto the scene, and that's why I say when Jesus shows up, Jesus not coming to play patty cake with you most of the time. Now, Jesus will come and save our soul. He will come and give us the spirit that animates and, and, and changes and transforms. But the process of transformation is not always a process of comfort. There's not, it ain't comfortable to change. It ain't comfortable to be faithful to who you are called to be. Because there's always going to be something pulling at you. Someone else's vision. Someone else's description. Someone else's opportunity. And at times, your faithfulness will be the very thing that causes you to stand and be aligned with God. Be aligned with how does God call me to act. Respond. That's why Jesus is so dope, right? Because Jesus knows how to talk to us through ordinary examples and make you and I keep thinking about that ordinary example with an extraordinary purpose. Salt and light, ordinary things. We, we use salt every day, but I've never thought salt to be that deep. So, so. We, we benefit from light every day. Light is a little more deeper than salt, I, I got to admit, because you be trying to where this light coming from. But, but, but salt and light, ordinary things that when Jesus gets a hold of it, becomes a metaphor for an eternally significant process. And it, it's good news that Jesus knows how to get a hold of something ordinary and make it eternally significant. Amen. Amen. Man, that, 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 that's just a little, 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 little affirmation of your ordinary existence. Yes. Because quiet as is kept, many of us have been taught that our ordinariness is a, 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 a discounting factor for your extraordinary impact or value. But your value is not tied to other people's, particularly this fallen world's, description of you. Because as we've already noted, people will teach history and leave all of us out of it. I mean, no, you shouldn't have to have a PhD to know about black history. You shouldn't have to have a master's degree to know about women's history. Amen. You shouldn't have to have a master's of divinity degree to know about the the, the ways in which our our religious traditions have 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 constituted and fall or fallen short or, 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 or reach beyond their human institutions. You and I have to remember that history is always complex, nuanced. So we're not just talking about black history. We got to remember there are black histories. We're not just talking about church history. We're talking about church histories. We're not just talking about your family history. We're talking about family histories. There are all kinds of ways to talk about histories. And these histories must remain in conversation with one another. And this is where Jesus, to me, offers you and I invaluable contributions. Because Jesus, by Jesus' own self-description, he says when he introduced himself, I am the word. I was there at the beginning. Jesus is like, listen, I've been around for all these histories. I'm not threatened by histories, even if I have to exist in a history to demonstrate my revelation to the world 
the history I exist in is not a threat to the histories that make up human experience. And sometimes in this country in particular, we are threatened by histories. And we feel like there ain't enough room for histories. So we compete for a history. But what if our competition for a history is not about the honoring of the many stories, it's actually a testament of the internalization of hegemony, of power, of greed and exploitation. If we follow Jesus faithfully, I believe that we're given a different way of living out our faith. Not in competition with one another, not with the coarseness and the meanness of this present, present time, because, you know, if you like me, uh, you know, I, 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 I often find myself drinking at the well of too much of this wicked commentary and observations. You know, because I haven't preached since November, pr pretty much, you know, I, I spend a lot of time uh, just reading the scripture for myself, you know, not, not trying to develop a sermon, which is mostly how many preachers read the text. You know, we're we not reading it devotionally. We're not reading it to feed our soul. We're reading it to try to come up with a sermon because, you know, y'all don't like to hear the same thing too many times. <laughs> like, Pastor, you preached about that last week. You're like, I know. <laughs> My study didn't go as well as I thought. <laughs> Man, so, you know, it's quite a grind. And you preaching every week and you trying to figure out, Lord, what, what do the word, how, what, what can I say to bless the people's heart? So for about three months, I just was able just to just read. Just. And I remember reading this passage, you know, because uh, I went back to the Sermon on the Mount, went back to the words of Jesus, because I was trying to figure out how was it I make sure that I'm not overdetermined by the words of Trump, by the words of nationalism, hatred, wickedness, white supremacy, anger, righteous indignation, all them words, you know, they, 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 they be informing a lot of my thinking because I'm trying to get free. And so these are the enemies of my freedom, at least so I think. So just reading scripture without having to think through some of that helped me to realize, man, you've given me some rules for living that outlast my current context. So I got a chance to do all this reading, and then I realized, man, I ain't preaching for a while, so I see all this kind of stuff that I need to be, you know, I would love to respond to. So I thought, maybe I'll start a blog. And I was like, no, nah, I don't like to really write like that. So I said, maybe I'll do a video blog that I just run my mouth. I was like, mm, I don't really know what to say. So I just kept reading. Now that I'm back to preaching, at least, at least this Sunday at least, uh, I, I can't tell everything that I've been thinking about, but I can say that this particular passage struck me, and when I saw it as a part of the lectionary, it helped me to think about why it's important for us to remember why we are here. Jesus says it like this, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, if you have had any experience with salt, it's a good thing mm -hmm. <laughs> in the right proportion. If you had any experience with light, good thing with the right proportion. But if you put too much salt on a thing, Amen. you know, in, in, in some of us, our way we, we describe people, you'd be like, you know, you kind of salty. That's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just some of you know. Someone describe me, man, why are you so salty? You ain't be like, oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I just, just trying to put some flavor, you know. It's not a compliment. Salt, when used properly, preserves. It provides some flavor. Mm -hmm. Some of us, you know, who are cooks, mm -hmm. appreciate when things don't have enough salt on it. You ain't even got to be a cook. You'd be like, man, it's, it's, where's, where's some garlic salt, some sea salt? Just give me any kind of salt. <laughs> some seasoned salt. <laughs> just... 
but you put too much salt on a thing, even if it's not seasoned enough, too much salt will make it taste bitter. Light, good thing, and you know, it's fascinating that we as uh, in this civilized uh, uh, era of existence on the planet have manipulated light, electricity, where we have interrupted the natural flow of how natural light orders our lives. You know, when the sun goes down, most of the time in history until recently, people stopped working. They went to sleep. Went home with their families, eating. I don't know, but they wasn't working. But ain't something you and I, we never stop working. You live in this Bay Area, boy, you'd be like, money is time. Time is money. And I, I'm, I'm going to manipulate this time for as much money as I can. I'm going to keep this light burning the midnight oil. Ain't that what you say? I'm going to be burning the midnight oil. I'm going to work eight hours here and eight hours there, sleep for two hours in between. Amen. Then get, it's just like, because cause, cause, cause light manipulated allows us to stretch what is naturally supposed to be limited. Light used properly illuminates. Light used properly provides clarity. It can even provide warmth. But when you have salt and when you have light in excess, too much salt will make you bitter. Too much light will make you blind. And yet Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It makes you and me have to ask ourselves then, what kind of contribution is our salt and light making in the lives of our families, our loved ones, our communities, Amen. dare I even say ourselves? Amen. What does it mean that you can be the salt, something that is a good contribution with the right proportion, Amen. but too much of a good thing turns into a bad thing? Man, you got to learn to ration yourself a little bit. Amen. Amen. Like, I know you more than most can handle. But if you know that to be true, don't give everybody everything all at one time. Amen. I'm just keeping it real, Pastor. No, don't keep it real. <laughs> we know, you know, no, we're not looking for that real today. We're looking for proportional salt. How many know there's a discipline to be proportional? Man, you go out to eat and, you know, and how many have traveled abroad and you get the, the meals from abroad and they give you a little bit of piece of meat like that, <laughs> two leaves and a twirl or something? <laughs> like, it's $30. What is this? What is this? Because we have been, <laughs> we have been groomed to consume excess. We've been groomed to give excess. You're giving too much all at one time. Jesus, great example. Jesus, wrapped up in the body of Jesus, is the fullness of the Godhead. All of the eternal existence of God, as much of God can be in a physical human body, got squeezed in there. And when Jesus showed up, Jesus didn't give everybody everything all at one time. Jesus healed a few folk, kept it moving. Fed a few, kept it moving. Because Jesus knew if I give you all of this at one time, too much salt, too much light. If Jesus had to practice proportional living, what does it say about you and I? Oh, my time is leaving me. Three things then that you got to remember. Number one, you and I have to remember rightly why we're here. Somebody say remember rightly. You and I have to remember 
Why are we here? Carter Woodson, G. Woodson, the founder, architect of Black History Month, he said like this, if a people has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a neg negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. Without a history, you have no memory. And without a memory, you are always starting from scratch. And how many of you can be honest that I am glad my grandmama told me them stories about God making a way out of no way? Amen. Amen. How many of us depend on them stories when you don't know what's getting ready to happen? Amen. Be like, oh, you used to, you know, like me growing up, you used to watch your grandmother be like laughing, you laughing at her. Oh, look at her, just, <laughs> she just. <laughs> But she, oh, you know, just start crying, or they hear him testify. I remember I needed thirty dollars for paying my light bill, and I opened the mailbox, and a fifty dollar check was there. And then she start, crying. and you just like, oh, grandma, you so crazy. <laughs> then you get to needing thirty dollars while you in school. You owe $30. You never knew $30 could mean so much. All of a sudden, you go to your, 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 your mailbox not expecting somebody to send you a check, and you get the check. You, ah! you start running around looking like your grandmama in there. <laughs> you didn't know that the history of God's faithfulness started before you got here. But you depended on that history to sustain you till you caught up to God's faithfulness. I wanna let you know that God's faithfulness will always outlast our unfaithfulness, our ignorance. Remember it rightly means that you and I have to ask ourselves, what must I unlearn? Because there's a lot of things you and I have learned that we can't carry into our future. And there, you know, uh, all, all kind of talk this week about the misogyny on display, you know, uh, after the Gail King interview and, and, and you know, uh, some of the homies, Snoop and, 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 and Bootsy and uh, everybody getting on TV and they, they calling people out their names and, and having a, a reaction that a lot of folk, resonated with. It was hurt. It's like, why are you going after Kobe Bryant? And I'm one of these Kobe stands. I love me some Kobe. I was telling him earlier, I got Kobe on my wall. I only got a picture of Jesus on my wall in my office. Amen. But I got Kobe on my wall. Because <laughs> Jesus in my heart, praise God. Amen. <laughs> I'm not one of these people who's just like, take it or leave it. But it is fascinating to me how we allow our unresolved anger, fear, pain, grief to lash out at the very people we are called to love. Even when I don't agree with you, I should never feel so angry and out of control that I use violence. Hello, somebody. Hello. Especially us as men, you know, when our energy and our, 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 our strength is disproportionate to others. We got to bring it on down. Even if I don't agree with you, bring it on down. Man, bring it on down. Because what if God responded to us with God's strength? <laughs> when God didn't like us, what we did. Mike, I don't like you did that. What, what, what do we ask for from God? Mercy. Grace. And you know, we, 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 you and I have become a people, I think, large because the way we've been raised. I, you know, my, my dad taught us, you know, that when you catching a bus growing up, you ain't supposed to walk around town grinning. Walk around on the bus and cheese. Walk down the street just grinning. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> that said, son, you you gonna have a problem. <laughs> you grow up in a violent context. People will prey on your happiness and your your tenderness. So some folk raised in these environments 
don't know no other way than, than just to be coarse and be harsh. It's not an excuse for our violence, though. Some things you and I have to unlearn. Because you can't be that way and be salt and light. Not the kind that's proportional. Whatever you inject into a thing that is not proportional becomes a barrier. So even if you got a point, your saltiness, you know, you've been out with people, they get their food before they even taste it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you ever been with somebody and they just doing that? You look at the like. <laughs> Did you taste that first? That's how some of us are. We don't think about what we're going to say, what we're going to do. So even our contributions we think that are with good intent become so bitter that your point gets nullified. Now, this is some good stuff. You know, I had to learn it myself because, you know, I've been the ball of prophetic critique against white supremacy and human hierarchy and oppressors. Amen. I, I love to talk about that stuff all day, every day. You put somebody in front of me that I think is a white supremacist, boy, I feel the Holy Ghost moving. I'd be like, oh, yes, for this time have I been called. I, 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 I know what to say, I know how to say it. But God is teaching me that even in my righteous indignation, I'm still called to be salt and light. So you gotta remember things rightly. What, what, what lessons can you bring to the fore that help you be appropriate? Uh, I, I'm almost done. Second thing that you gotta think about, maintain your influence. Salt and light is about influence. If you get disqualified, guess what? Your influence just diminishes. And Dr. King used this analogy the first time I heard it. Are you a thermostat or a thermometer? I think I got a picture. You can't see it all that well. But on one side, you got a thermometer. Thermometers, at least in these examples, filled with mercury. And the mercury, depending on the heat in the room, the mercury rises or it drops. Then you got a thermostat. The thermostat is the thing that controls the temperature in the room. You turn it one way, it gets warm. Turn it another way, it gets colder. Your influence, child of God, as salt and light, requires you to ask yourself, am I the one being more influenced and determined by my environment? Or am I being through the power of God's spirit, the principles of, of Christian faith and formation, becoming an influencer? And dare I say right now, how many know the world needs more godly influence? If the scripture says that your Godliness must be tasty. People got to taste your godliness. That means when you show up, folk got to notice that there is something you're bringing to the table that has not the, shook, the salt shaking so much that it becomes bitter. And how many met Christians like that? Amen. You be like, boy, you brought the fire. I'll be glad when you leave so the fire can go right along with you. Because <laughs> yeah, it's already 90 degrees up in here. I don't need your righteous indignation. I don't need that fire. I, I got enough seasoned salt. I got enough paprika and, and Mrs. Dash. And I got enough of that in my stuff. I don't need more of your saltiness now. And that's a hard thing for us to learn. It's a hard thing for me to learn. Because when I show up, I just want to show up. I'm here. And you're going to take me like I am. Then you be there by yourself. With all you is. I come don't nobody like me because you too much. <laughs> you 
because I can tell you the truth today. You've learned certain behaviors, certain ideas. It was your best, uh, no, not your best, it was all you had. You, all you were told about women was one way. Queer folks was one way. White folks, black folks, rich folk, poor folk, Christians, Muslims, this is all you was told. And you think that was the best knowledge. No, that ain't the best knowledge. It can't be the best knowledge if you only read one book, if you only know one person. That's not all the knowledge. That's not the best knowledge. So guess what? Part of what you have to be, if you're going to be a thermostat, you got to be a lifelong learner. You have to be someone who's willing to submit yourself to some teachers, some experiences that might not be your own. When you're in a relationship with someone, you got to learn some things you didn't know. Be all right with you being told that don't work. What you mean my mayonnaise sandwich don't work? This is good mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. We're not feeding the kids that. That was food when we didn't have no money. You grew up in Goldsboro, North Carolina, in the country with no grocery stores. And mayonnaise was gifted to us by our aunts and uncles and some bread. So that's the best you had back then. But man, we're not feeding a lot. You know, I didn't understand that at first. I ate mayonnaise, but they can't eat mayonnaise. <laughs> but how I many know that's how simple some of us are? It was good for me. Feels good for me. Why, why it don't work for them? That was 50 years ago, man. Since, you know, this is the 21st century. The second decade in the 21st century. Tell me, though, even what you did in the 90s. Lord, we getting old. Because, you know, to me, the 90s was the golden years. What? You couldn't tell me nothing about no 90s? Now these kids don't want to hear nothing. My daughters don't want to listen to nothing. I'll be trying to play music for them. I'll be like, you listening to this? Daddy, I, I, want, I want to listen to Cardi B. I'm like, <laughs> Cardi don't got nothing. This is Whitney Houston, girl. Maintaining your influence means sometimes you got to ask yourself, am I a thermometer? Am I a thermostat? Last thing I'll say, then we're going to pray. Salt and light means you have to be comfortable shining. Shine, shine, shine. What will you do with your influence? How will your influence impact your surroundings? I love the way Jesus talks about this thing here because Jesus says, you the light of the world. You like a city on a hill. Then Jesus also says, and you're like a lamp on a stand. A city on a hill and or a lamp on the stand. A city feels like a pretty great proportion. A lamp seems a little scaled down. Your shine, our shine, may not always have the impact of a city on a hill, but it will always have the impact of a lamp on a stand. Not all of us are going to have the ability to shine with that level of brightness. Amen. That's okay, because it's not about the size of your shine. It's about the strategic placement of your shine. Sometimes we get in trouble because we start comparing ourselves to one another. I want to be a city. Oh, you ain't built for this city life. So go and get that stand and shine. 
Because many, many folk who got that city life want to trade it in for a stand. Because both of these have a certain kind of unique pressure. And, and it's not a commentary on anyone's value. It's a description, as Jesus says, of our flavors. If everybody was a city, who would hang out with the people who live in the rural? If everybody was a lamp, who would meet the people in the city? If everybody worked at Cal, who would work at Stanford? If everybody was in the church, who would bless those outside the church? If everybody was rich, if everybody was poor, appreciate that all of us together have a unique situatedness that is about how we shine. And our lifelong task, I believe, is to master our shine. Amen. I had a young person, I'm gonna close with this, that I, I was mentoring, he was one, one of the knuckleheads, like, you know, knuckleheads term of endearment for, you know, some of these young, young people I used to work with when I was a little more in the streets. He was, he, you know, you shoot people, you know, rob people. And, you know, he, 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 he got, came into my youth group and, you know, after a lot of fasting, praying, laying on of hands, you know, we, we cast the devil out of him, praise God. And he became a more peaceful person. But he went, like, he was a lot. Like, just too much. Ah, you know, just hyphy on fleek. It's like, you know, that's a, that's a, what is that's a double, d double, that, you know, hyphy and fleet, the same thing. It's like, he was hyphy on fleet. He was just too much. And he was like that, you know, when he got saved, when he became a Christian, he was just too much, just too aggressive. And just, you know, oh, Jesus loves you. And, ah! He'd be like, no, no, no. I don't want that Jesus. I'll stay atheist. I don't want that Jesus. It's too much. Jesus, that Jesus too aggressive. So, you know, we, I was talking to him one day, and, and you know, he, he just was, oh, Pastor Mike, I don't understand why people, people, they just don't respond to me, you know. Uh, you know, when I was out in the world, you know, everybody was with me, you know, now I'm, you know, in church, and people just, you know, I was like, you know, breathe, brothers. Take a breath. I said, you know, it, 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 it's like this. You, you know, if back in the day, we have lanterns. They had lanterns, not we, I'm not that old, but, you know, lanterns before electricity. People used lanterns. This was the first way to manipulate light, or night. And in the lantern, you had oil that fed a spigot, string or something, wicked. <laughs> I say spigot. <laughs> a wick. <laughs> Thank you, Moshe. Lord have mercy. Sleep deprived. Uh, and, and, you light the wick, and it produces fire or light. The oil that's in the lantern is enough to make that light shine bright or not at all. And there's a knob. You turn the knob, and the fire will grow, produce a lot of light. You turn it down and it won't produce any at all. You turn the knob too quickly, and the whole lantern will blow up and catch on fire. Because too much oil on that wick will produce a flame that the lantern can't hold. And it'll hurt the person holding the lantern and maybe even people in proximity to the lantern. I told him, you got to master the knob that controls the oil to the wick. Because the problem with you is not the oil or the fire, it's the knob. Sometimes it's just too much all at one time. Your shine, my shine, our shine has to be about, God, how can we have the discipline to control the knob? That helps our shine 
to not consume everything and everyone, including ourselves. Because the life that you've been given, it's a good life. The oil you've been given, we say it's the oil of the Holy Spirit. It's a good thing. But if that is too much at one time, your shine creates blindness. And your salt creates bitterness. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Come on, let's stand again. Let's invite God to help us be faithful to both our salt and our light. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. As you grab the hand of the person next to you, I invite you to gently squeeze their hand and just ask the Lord, Lord God, give them a sense of the salt and light that have been strategically deposited within them. May they be conscious of where their shine is needed the most, where their salt is needed the most, and more than anything, God, may they proportionately bring salt and light to their environments in ways that add flavor and not bitterness ways that illuminate and not cause more blindness. As I touch my loved one today with great hope and peace and possibility, God, I pray that the strength of the living God will be theirs. May they see, may they know that you are present with them. And as God is me, Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer, it is not my mother, it is not my father. It is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need your healing. I need your power. I need your strength. God, may the salt that you have given me, may the light that you have produced from my experiences, my pain, my tragedy, God, may it all, Lord, may it be a a vehicle, God, for you to get some glory. For your, your, your glory to be made manifest. May it be a vehicle for my own healing, for our own healing, for the restoration of relationships and, and, and the elimination of hierarchies and fragmentations and division. God, with my hands lifted, I, I need you, Lord, to make my salt not lose its flavor. Make my light not be hid. Do it in the name of Jesus. Do it in the name of Jesus. Come on, take a few moments and just ask the Lord to do something for you right now. Do something for your light, your soul, your family, your children, your career, your, 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 your most ultimate divine purpose. God, do it for me and may the strength of the Lord be mine. You are my strength. Yes, strength like strength like no other. Say it again. Strength like no other. And it reaches to me. Reaches to me. We're almost done, but say it again.